The National Dream, John A. Macdonald's National Policy and the Canadian Pacific Railway. To start, you may want to look and watch this short video of the history of the CP Railway. It'll help you understand the purpose of what does the railway serve now and the role it did in the past. Remember back in the second industrial revolution, we explored how railways were being used as a form of a nation building exercise for any countries that wanted to industrialize. Canada will be one of those countries. To start, the Canadian Pacific Railway was not the first railway to be built in Canada. Technically, the first railway was the Grand Trunk Railway. The Grand Trunk Railway was a railway system in eastern Canada and the northeastern American states. It was built and operated in the 1850s, so before Confederation. But it did help to build Canada by getting industries and workers. It did have the first bridge over the St. Lawrence River. However, like many of these large-scale projects, it nearly went bankrupt and relied heavily on government bailout to get it done and to continue the operations. Despite all that, eventually the Grand Trunk was merged with the Canadian National Railways years after the CP Railway was built. As you can see on this map, these dark lines represented the Grand Trunk Railway. They're kind of like spider veins of the sorts. But John A. Macdonald had a dream. He wanted to create a nation that would rival the United States, a nation that would go from sea to sea. But he had a question, and that was, how could this be done? And being this was in the 1800s, during the time of the Second Industrial Revolution, the answer was the Canadian Pacific Railway. You may want to take a moment to explore this visual before you continue. But the CP Railway, John A's plan, our first Prime Minister, had a three part. For it, the first part, the railway. The railway was a needed transportation and communication link throughout Canada. British Columbia's entry in Confederation in 1871 depended on the promise of a transcontinental railway being built to the Pacific within 10 years. In fact, actually, British Columbia asked Ottawa to complete building a wagon road, but Ottawa offered the people of BC a railway instead. The second part was territory. John A. Macdonald needed to establish control of the Northwest to bring settlers into the area. This is why we studied from before Louis Riel, the Red River Resistance, the Métis, and the creation of Manitoba. Winnipeg is a central point of this whole expansion and the establishing of the country. Territory was needed to establish law and authority into the prairie provinces or territories because of the ongoing external threat by the Americans. Third was money. Building a railway is very, very expensive. Even today, a uh, SkyTrain line in Metro Vancouver of uh, less than 40 kilometers will cost a couple billion dollars. Put that perspective of building a railway across the country, a railway of thousands of kilometers, you can imagine how expensive that would be. So to get this done, the government needed uh, able industrialist, the one who knows and can control the industry and also have the money to financially back a project. That person would be Sir Hugh Allen. Sir Hugh Allen was apparently the only able Canadian industrialist who was able to build a railway. Hugh Allen had formed a company called the Canadian Pacific Railway, but Hugh Allen did not have the money that he claimed to have had. The money was actually coming from an American. His name was Jay Cook. Jay Cook had no interest in wanting to create a Canadian railway. He was wanting to build a railway across the area known as Canada, so it would be a branch of the greater American transcontinental railways. Something like this, though, so even back in the 1800s, the truth would come out, and that would be a political scandal. A very big, big scandal for the Canadian government. So, what is a scandal? A scandal is, is, according to the Canadian Oxford Dictionary, is when someone or something has caused general public outrage or indignation. An example of a scandal would be a former Premier of British Columbia. His name was Gordon Campbell. While he did serve several terms as Premier of BC, one time while he was vacationing uh, in uh, Christmas time, I believe, in Hawaii, he was arrested 
by the Hawaiian authorities for driving under the influence. So, a scandal is a general outrage or indignation towards from the public. This will be the Pacific scandal between Hugh Allen and John A. MacDonald, these two guys. In 1872, the general election and the scandal. 1872 was when we had the first Canadian election. Canada was established in 1867, but the very first actual election didn't happen until five years later. In the election, even though MacDonald had uh, managed to stay in power, he lost many seats. He lost a lot of support. During the election, too, John A. MacDonald's political party did not have the money to finance the election. So documents were forged to make it look like MacDonald was part of Hugh Allen's railway company's payroll, a payroll that was also financed by the American. This is the Pacific scandal because the American... Americans were not viewed with the most optimistic of points of view from game point of view because of the American thought of manifest destiny. As a result of the first political scandal, John A. MacDonald resigned. The person who actually won the election, Mackenzie, canceled the contract. Hugh Allen lost a charter. You may want to check this video on, from CBC to show about this. But you see in political cartoons like this, McDonald, I, I highlight in bigger, I admit I took the money and bribed the electors with it. Is there anything wrong about that? Well, when we look at political cartoons, you think about biasness, exaggeration, setting, and this kind of a cartoon, think about the morality of that decision. But the scandal made it so John A. lost the first election in Canada. Alexander Mackenzie was the leader of the Liberal Party. Mackenzie did not like the railway. He referred to the railway as that damned railway. And Mackenzie also disagreed with McDonald's vision of a nation that could be built by a railway. The reason why he disagreed with the vision was the cost. There was a financial economic depression across both Canada and the continental United States. Thus, building a railway across a country was going to be too much trouble and way too expensive for this country to afford. And so he did not want to have any railway construction during his time as prime minister. There would be a problem with that decision, though. A problem would come from British Columbia. British Columbia, as you recall, was promised a railway to be part of Canada. From the people of BC's point of view, if the railway is cancelled, the contract is null and void, and people of BC could either become an independent country, go back to being a colony of Great Britain, or negotiate terms of joining with the United States. Um, yeah, that's a problem. Mackenzie did not want to be the Prime Minister who lost British Columbia. What we do to try to satisfy this? The answer would be the Canadian Pacific Survey. The Canadian Pacific Survey was conducted by Sanford Fleming. His role was to figure out all possible routes for this national railway. Mackenzie wanted to essentially do something to appease the people of BC and honor their terms. This is referred to as the Battle of the Routes there. Actually, it's kind of interesting, if you recall back in the geography unit, we learned about time zones. Well, Sanford Fleming was the guy who came up with the idea of standard time, and some, not all places have the same time with each other. An interesting historical one. You may want to check on that link to explore more of that for your inquiry. But despite that, John and McDonald does come back. Typically, the Prime Minister will resign and walk away once he or she loses the election. McDonald did not. A few years after the election, McDonald has successfully recovered from the scandal, and he had a new plan, his national policy. His national policy will have a three-part plan of how he can build this country. Part number one would be a system of protective tariffs, essentially taxes. 
taxes on any goods that were made outside of Canada. He wanted to protect the small Canadian industries from the much larger American industries. The second part of the plan would be Western settlement. Well, the Canadian prairies, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, would be um, used as farmland, even though the Cinnaboyne, the Ojibwe, the Cree, the Métis had, referred, had, had this land as their ancestral territory for a long, long time. MacDonald wanted this land to be used for farming, a topic with the First Peoples we can explore on a different day. Posters like this shows just how much the government wanted to use the land in the prairies for farming and what they will use to entice people to come to the prairies. For example, that's not a typo. The government was actually offering 160 acres of free land to come and live and farm in the prairies. To see on this poster on the left hand side there, you look in the middle and it's a little small, but Canada's in the middle and both sides on the west and the east of Canada, you can see areas that are colored in red and pink. Those are British territories or areas under the British influence. John A. Macdonald saw Canada as being the middle, kind of like a linchpin for the entire empire to transport goods and to be a breadbasket for the British Empire. The empire that was fairly big by this point. John A. also wanted um, settlers from select Eastern European countries like Poland or Ukraine to come and live on the prairies and farm. You may want to pause this video to read through this song. It's exaggerated, but it does get the point across. But the third part of the plan from the taxes and the farmers, the third part was the railway. The railway was, construction was necessary for the survival of Canada. It needed to bring goods and settlers from the West to export the weed, to be violent to the empire. It's all part of the plan. Recall, Sanford Fleming had two routes he had picked out. Will's call the pink is the north, the red will call is the south. Sanford recommended the north route, but the government chose the, north, the southern route, the red route to be the route for the railway, where the pink route would be used generally for the CN Railway, the Canadian National Railway, later on in the 19th century. How to get this be paid for? A syndicate would be formed, the CP Rail Syndicate. A syndicate is a group of Canadian investors who are formed to fund the building of the Canadian Pacific Railway. John A. Macdonald made them an offer they cannot refuse. The offer was $25 million, 25 million acres, and a monopoly of all traffic. They gave him all he thought they would need to finance the construction is railway and for each member of the syndicate to make a nice profit. Their promise would be the railway need to be built in 10 years. The first year though, construction fell behind schedule. Only 230 kilometers were built. One reason for that is because in British Columbia there's a lot of mountains. Mountains are very pretty to look at but very expensive to build in. Because of that, the first manager was fired. A new manager was hired. His name was Van Horn. Van Horn was referred to as the most ablest railway general in the world. Even though he was an American, which usually would have caused issues, this time around the general public was willing to look the other way because he had built the American transcontinental railway across continental United States. That's a pretty impressive resume. So he was hired on and was tasked with how to find ways to reduce the costs, cut corners, save a few bucks for it. See, in this kind of photograph, this is an example of how costs were cut. If you count up between the spaces, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, give or take, that's a 10 story wooden bridge across the river. If you look around the photograph as a primary source, you can see where the wood came from. An iconic photo in Canadian history. But what was life like for the workers? It was a hard knock life. 
You need about 30,000 men to lay about 1,000 miles of track, about 1,700 kilometers. The living and working conditions were dangerous. Dust from dynamite, you have lots of insects. The bunkhouses where the men stayed at were overcrowded. They were filthy. The roofs leaked. There was no plumbing. Uh, unlike today where there's like grocery stores and convenience stores everywhere. Those did not exist yet, so there was very little amount of fresh fruits and veggies during the winter time. No medical facilities, no workers' compensation, so if a worker became injured, you're fired. You're let go. So safety was essentially not a concern for the workers there. They had just the mentality of get the job done. That being said, as, as tough as the construction work was for Canadian workers, when you compare it to the NAM railway being built in Australia through the Australian Outback or like Trans Siberian Railway across Russia and Mongolia, this was actually really nice level of living and working conditions compared to those railway projects. Another thing about the railway was kind of neat is it was not just the actual uh, railway being built. You see this photograph on the left hand side, there's like telegraph lines there, or other sort of companies and businesses that were part of the railway, um, postal services, hotels, uh, ocean liners. They even had like a messenger pigeon service to, I think, Newfoundland. The point is, there's quite a few other businesses that would spur on that would be created as a result of this one project. That typically happens for public kind of projects. However, despite of all this though, there was still one problem. It wasn't enough. What ultimately saved the railway in the end was the Northwest Rebellion. The Northwest Rebellion that included the Cree because they were starving to death, and the Métis who lost ancestral land in Manitoba, with Louis Riel coming back from the United States who was in exile. The Northwest Rebellion saved the railway. Um, it gave John A. Macdonald all the political will he needed to quickly fund the gaps in the line in the prairie provinces and the people like the Métis and Cree thought they had months to prepare. When in fact, actually the soldiers had arrived in Winnipeg less than five days uh, later. The railway allowed the government to send soldiers and Gatling guns and supplies out into the prairies to do battles like a Battle of Tosh, Battle of Fish Creek, Battle of Duck Lake, these battles in the Northwest Rebellion. The Northwest Rebellion ultimately um, uh, saved it, the railway because people realized the railway was needed to also respond to national crisis. And John A. did spin this as a war, that the whole Western Canada was rising up. You know, there's, you know, once again, these are topics we'll explore in a couple of weeks. The CP Railway was a quick fix there because people realized the need of a transportation link there and to get it done. And um, even though the, the syndicate was given 10 years to complete um, the railway because of the Northwest Rebellion by by the people, it was done in five years, which led to this famous photograph of the last spike in Carlagadi, British Columbia. However, take a look at this photo. Do you see someone who's missing? You gotta look carefully on those kind of details. This is the last spike. That's the real last spike. Do you see the difference? The previous one was a stage photo. This was the actual one with the actual workers building the, putting the last railway strike into the ground to fulfill the promise to British Columbia. Last few topics with the railway. Sometimes trains we use as funeral trains for like a statewide national funeral, such as when Johnny McDonald passed away, where a train would transport the remains of the of the dead person and stop at various towns or cities along the way so mourners can pay respect. The train would also be used by the royal family when they toured in Canada last time it was being used that way by the royals was in 1931. 
or 39, sorry, when King George VI and a young Queen Elizabeth toured Canada from Quebec City to Vancouver. Now they just use airplanes, but still is an option. And the last is the Chinese workers. Chinese workers from this photograph and this photograph were given the difficult task of building the railway in BC. Lots of accidents would happen as a result of building a railway through the most dangerous parts. We'll explain more about this when we look into the history of British Columbia. Thank you.